Welcome to the 68th episode of an Evolving Man podcast. Today, I'm excited to be speaking to Wendy Capewell. Wendy is a fully qualified BACP accredited counsellor and psychotherapist with over 18 years of professional experience. She specialises in helping people with childhood trauma, anxiety, stress and relationships and was a volunteer counsellor at a rape and sexual abuse centre for five years. She is the author of the book, Surviving to Thriving in Relationships. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you, Piers. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Yeah, pleasure, pleasure. So, yeah, I I came across your work, I think it was mainly through LinkedIn. I'd seen quite a few of your posts, and I think we've got similar connections. Mm. And as I was reading, listening to your podcast, I was like, oh, I'd, I'd love to hear you speak about these specialist areas like childhood trauma and relationships. How I love to begin the podcast is for you to share a bit of your own journey. What got you into the work you now do? It's a really interesting one, and I don't think <laughs> many people would have had this journey. Mm. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. Um, I was in a in a relationship. It was a very um, it was quite an abusive relationship. It was quite toxic. Uh, and the only way I felt I would try and do things that would calm him. And because I felt if I did what he wanted, then he would stop. He would leave me alone. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things he said, because my career was before that was all in admin and finance. But I always said my claim to fame was that I never got a balance sheet to balance. It really was the writing on the wall that I wasn't in the right career at all. (laughs) Uh, But one of the things he said was I was very good at listening. Mm -hmm. And that was if I if he was talking and I was listening again, it, it would calm the relationship down. And he said, well, have you ever thought about being a counsellor? So, because I thought, well, maybe if I do that, that will be something that will please him. And I decided to try it. Um, And I was hooked. Mm. Um, One of the things, I learnt techniques and um, insights that really made me realise that how I could leave the relationship So it was a very strange situation in a way because every time I'd ask him to leave or I'd try to leave, it wouldn't happen. But because of what I learned in very early time was how to step out of this situation. And in the end, he packed up and left. Mm. Um, It was very sad because he had been through an awful lot of childhood abuse physically, emotionally, mentally, sexually, all of that. Um, But it affected adversely our relationship. But it also gave me, I wanted to then, I needed to heal, but I wanted to learn more about childhood abuse because I'd been in that relationship for about six years. I didn't know how to deal with it any other way. And I needed to understand more about why he was so badly affected. He he was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, but I imagine he had, I think there were a lot of things that he struggled with. So that is it. So it's a very unusual way of getting into this kind of work. Mm, it is, it is. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it sounds like that was a challenge to have been in that relationship. Yes, it was. It was, because obviously my stuff was adding into it as well but when you you don't know what you don't know so of course we weren't we weren't a particularly good match really so we didn't help each we didn't really yes we didn't aid each other we can't we can't help each other to heal but certainly we would have triggered each other quite a lot Mm -hmm. thank you wendy i think I'd love for you to to share a little bit about in your work and you talk about this a bit on your website about childhood trauma. Mm. Yeah, could you go into a bit more depth? What is it? And then the second question would be, how does it impact this child? I think childhood trauma can be 
numerous, vast, very varied. Um, a child can be traumatized even within the mother's womb. Mm -hmm. um, if a if the if the mother is anxious, stressed, or, or whatever she's going through, obviously it will affect the unborn baby. Uh, we know that babies can hear what's going on outside the womb. Um, also, so there are all sorts of things. So if there's it's a bad situations between the parents, or if the mother is badly affected, it's that it can start there. A baby can have a traumatic birth, mm. so that can also be a trauma. And if they don't bond with the parent, if the bonding's not there, um, John Bowlby's work mm. on, back in the nineteen forties but very much about the attachment theory. And I think there's a lot to be learned. I mean, numerous people have done a lot more work on that since. Mm -hmm. I think anybody who's interested to look at different attachment styles, that's another area where we can feel trauma, you know, trauma, feel traumatic experiences. Um, it could be the things that parents or caregivers do, but it can also be the things that they didn't do. So if they didn't meet the child's needs, then the child will be affected. Um, it can be childhood illnesses. Um, it can be parents' illnesses. It can be abandonment by a child, by a parent, um, such as if um, there's divorce or the parents part, the child, they can feel abandoned by their, their parent. It can be death of a parent caregiver there are so many different areas where a child can feel that traumatic experience mm. does that help yeah that does that does so once that experience has happened the death of a parent or abandonment what then happens to the child how does the child react to that what do we see if we've got a child ourselves and we're like oh Maybe my child has had some form of trauma. I wasn't present for it. What might the, some of the symptoms be, Wendy? Well, the, it can be so, it, it can be so so many. A child can be um, a people pleaser. They can be, you know, we hear about children seeking attention, but actually they're seeking attachment. Mm -hmm. um, they're craving that I want to feel attached to you because. Let's face it, a child cannot survive in the world on its own. It can't feed itself. It can't clothe itself. It can't keep itself warm. It just can't exist. It, it needs the attachment figure so badly to be able to survive. So they'll find survival techniques, which may not be obvious in their minds, but they'll find a way. So they might be a people pleaser constantly trying to do the right thing um, they might act out which means that they might become difficult um, and negative attention is better than no attention at all let's face it um, they might become very withdrawn they, they might um, they can get ill because if i'm ill you pay attention to me um, they and as they get older they'll Quite, quite often turn to drugs, alcohol, any other kind of addiction, because that is filling the gap that the parent did. Um, so, I mean, there's a myriad of things. How do they cope? Um, yeah, we have all find ways of surviving in the world. And they are numerous, <laughs> so many numerous ones. And I don't, you know, you, you see children being blamed for being naughty, being bad, being um, difficult. But that child is needing something. It's missing something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're doing their best to get what they need. But they haven't got the emotional intelligence. They haven't got the experience. They're doing it the way they can. They might get angry. They might cry. They might get, as I say, they might get sick. They'd just be constantly trying to, please the other person you know the parent or anybody for that matter mm, thank you 
So yeah, people pleasing, acting out. It's interesting. I, as I mentioned before we started recording, I've been off on retreat for a, a week, and I really noticed the people pleaser in me. Yeah. You know, I try to make everybody happy. I when I was a child, I'm much better now. Just been reading Richard Grannon's book, uh, Cult of One, who he specialises in narcissism. Um, who I'm going to be speaking to at the end of this month. And he talked about the six to eight qualities of a people pleaser. I'm like, oh, I've got quite a lot of those. Um, so I can can really resonate. I also, as you're speaking, thinking of Susan Zedike, who I spoke to on my podcast last year, who's a developmental psychologist. Yeah. And she's been posting on Twitter, and I don't know the exact wording, but saying a lot of people are talking about expelling five-year-old children from school and what she's saying is well what happened two years ago when they were two or three ah covid they were traumatized these are traumatized children rather than seeing them as bad so i really resonated with that yeah and and i know it's much more of a thing now people are talking about much more you know um gabon marty who we both Mm -hmm. um, admire greatly um he uh um the body keeps the score yeah. but before i even was connecting with people like him and peter levine and so on mm -hmm. i was noticing in my clients of of physical manifestations of trauma i i clear i've been mean, numerous ones but i clearly remember one case of a a woman who was in her 40s um and she told me that she developed type 1 diabetes when she was 11 years old. Mm. I said, okay, what was happening in your life at that time? What was going on? Um, her parents had parted and her mother tried to end her life. And, and this goes on here. I'm sure you've heard her stories. It just, you can't disconnect it. You can't disconnect the body a physical body from our emotional and I don't think people realize that unless we do the work unless we really figure some of this out and try to help ourselves we, and if we're pushing it down all the time that it will our body will our body's going to react in some way mm -hmm. yeah it, yeah thank you just to wear the microphone is it possible to bring it more towards the center just so you're a bit closer to it is it possible to is that any better that's much better oh okay thank you <laughs> um yeah i really resonate with that with the physical you know and i love um bessel van der Kolk's book the body keeps the score uh, and i just you know i can so resonate with yeah we have these symptoms come later on i guess that's what i'd love to explore a little bit more so we've had this childhood trauma we've had you know abandonment death of a parent and then we have these symptoms as a child how might they manifest as an adult that we go actually i need to go and see someone because maybe i had some child trauma i don't remember yeah and i think what's really i want to say just stop for a moment about the trauma we don't remember because mm. our brain is incredibly clever mm. because it will sometimes will forget things the body the brain says this is too much mm. i'm not gonna i'm just gonna block it out and especially when i worked with survivors of childhood abuse and still do the, the body says that's it no you're gonna shut it out and, and people have said to me, i i just can't remember and i said that's your brain that's your body protecting you because that was so awful that it said no 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 we can't keep that we can't keep that as a memory it's too much but yes and again it is this is gabba marty and he says we will feel we'll be triggered so when we feel that and i i feel it myself that the initial trauma will be triggered by either a smell, a taste, a word, a person. Uh, it could be a myriad of things, any, anything that affects our senses, all our senses. We could be triggered by that. And when we get triggered, we will feel the same intensity of emotion as we did in that first 
event as a child. And that's what is so hard to kind of figure that out. Is it how does that happen? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We can't remember the event, but we'll still feel the same intense intensity of sadness, fear, whatever that sense was, abandonment. It's amazing how we feel it to the same degree. But yeah, it will manifest. And then it can be, I feel abandoned. I'm not loved. I'm not cared about. I'm... And maybe anger, you know, people will suddenly just flare up for no reason, that they will just explode. They can't figure out why they're reacting in such a violent way to something that, you know, doesn't fit the situation. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Anger. I read one of your articles this morning about, um, I think it was strategy to protect ourselves from being vulnerable and you mentioned anger could be one of these these ways mm. um and that was reflecting i've noticed you know i get a sense there's so much pressure being put on people that these defense mechanisms you know, i'm seeing a lot more anger i was driving up to the monastery for a retreat and there was a couple of guys men i think quite rude it was like whoa road rage and it's like you know uh and i haven't seen that before so it's like that pressure mm. really spewing out yeah i think there's a lot of it post pandemic and i think life hasn't got back to normal there is no way it's got back to normal um i think i've noticed there's a lot more people are more anxious they're more fearful mm. they're not able to connect so easily there are a lot more people struggling with social anxiety but I think when we were isolated for two years then it, it, we're sociable beings and we need that connection but if, if you're if you're pulled away from it you're saying it's not safe surely we've got to react because of it it well we haven't had that practice but we're also we're told it's not it's fearful and then you also got in getting all the media i mean every single i don't watch the news i haven't watched the news in about 15 years because it damages 20 years <laughs> um but even if i scroll through the headlines it's all fear-based mm -hmm. terrestrial television is all fear-based or unpleasant things and things to make us fearful like i don't know you know a and e or something programs about a and e or or situation i mean some of them are informative but i think there are others where it makes us quite scared mm -hmm. um and i think so there's a lot so there's there's that and then well services haven't got back to normal well we're, we're moving away from that connection now it's everything is online and you're trying to get hold of somebody to get some help you can't it's going to be a you're going to stay in a queue for hours on end you're going to be uh, just have a chat but maybe it's just an automated response mm -hmm. i think there's a sheer frustration around well how can we cope um train strikes i'm not saying whether i'm not going into the political side of that or who's right who's wrong but the mere fact you can't get to work or can't get home um, cost of living rise there's so many things that are adding into that total frustration that i think people are feeling now mm -hmm. yeah yeah and it's almost like that period was a trauma and what we're hearing and we're seeing now is a kind of an ab reaction to that trauma the anxiety the fear the frustration and i, I loved what um Desmond Tutu did after the um, uh, the post-apartheid, he would go from township to township and he would do this truth and reconciliation. People would speak and then they would sing and they would dance. Then they would speak and share their stories. And from what I've heard is there was very little trauma that continued. It's almost like we need to do that. And obviously my work's around boarding school and our need to speak up but also post-COVID, 
actually a bit like Peter Levine in his work. He says that the the gazelle is chased by the lion, and then if he or she manages to escape, they shake it off, yes. and then they return to normal. We haven't had a chance to shake COVID off. Well, we don't as humans. Yeah. I think animals are so much cleverer than we are. Yeah. They shake the trauma out of their bodies. We don't. We we internalize it. We told you must to make a fuss. Stop yeah. making a fuss. Keep it down. So you internalize it out of guilt, shame, the inability, to, whatever it is. But that that's where the damage is. That's where the trauma stays, unless we work through it, speak it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, very wise. Yeah. So I guess then how i'd love for us to segue into is about relationships how does trauma show up in relationships uh, wendy wow well i i kind of like go to go back to that last relationship if i may because my partner had as i had explained all the traumas he'd been through not in detail obviously but the headlines he didn't feel safe so if he didn't feel safe when he was a child, then he would be his trust. He didn't have any trust because the people who should have been there for him abused him. So anybody that you should feel trust with is not safe. So that would trigger him in the relationship with me. So if I were to go out, if I was going to work, he would question, why are you putting makeup on? Why are you doing that? Why are you late home from work? He, he, would, he would be so scared, but it felt to me like it was control. Well, hold on, what's the problem? You're controlling me. So those kinds of things would happen. And then he just couldn't control his emotions. He just couldn't regulate them. And it would show up a lot in that situation, you know, the, the lack of trust, um, being very needy, needing that connection, that attachment. Mm -hmm. So it was, I need you here all the time. I need you. I need you to be here. So those kinds of things were happening. Whereas for me, my the way I grew up, I didn't have the attachment. So for me, it was more avoidant attachment. I'm too scared to attach totally because it wasn't safe as a child. So I thought it was too much. And it was, look, I'm independent. I've had to be independent. That was my survival, my coping mechanism. So the two really clashed against each other. So that's the kind of thing it can show up in. Lack of trust. not And lack of communication is a big one. Mm -hmm. Miscommunication, lack of communication, missing each other. I think couples so often feel that because maybe you, you, you're you in a relationship with somebody that has the same, allegedly the same background, that is, you know, you come from the same country, the same county, maybe, um, that you're going to get on, that, you know, it'll everything will fall into place. But each of us have had a different experience and therefore communication, lack of communication is a big one. So I think it can show up in lots of ways. Um, I think as well, if we've experienced less than helpful role models, we mm. may follow them. So if we had a, a parent who um, cheated, or, cheated all the time on their, their partner, that will be a role model. Okay, we've experienced that as a child, but then, well, that must be how the world, world works. A lot of this is out of our awareness, but we're still, well, where are our boundaries? Because they're shot to pieces quite often. Yeah. Thank you. They're not modelled to us. Mm. Mm. So kind of shows up lack of communication, not feeling safe, trying to control. You know, I, I often hear this with my clients. And certainly the wives or the partners that contact me saying that, you know, my kind of client group is mainly ex-boarders. So it's like the control 
you know we were very much controlled as children and this is as i shared about making the documentary earlier it's why i'm fascinated by if our leaders were in that environment they were very controlled would that therefore show up in how they lead and you, you mentioned before about leaders you know <laughs> uh so yes <laughs> i did i i think i feel quite strongly i think there are leaders I don't believe that we have leaders at the moment. Um, yeah, there are leaders in the world. Uh, um, uh, what, who was the form, former uh, Prime Minister of New Zealand? Um, uh, Ardern, I think her name is. Yes, uh, I saw her as a leader. She mm -hmm. was leading from the front, by example. Um, very much the nurturing parent. Mm. Um, and her communication was really spot on. She was talking to people all the time, not demeaning them, asking people to cooperate. I don't live in New Zealand, so I don't know what it was like to be in there, but I certainly know that we were almost, it was like controlled. It was, it was control through, um, fear and control is how we were believed that's how to get through the pandemic. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah thank you thank you so moving on into relationship going a bit deeper um if we are struggling in relationships and i would suggest that there's a, a large percentage of us do i almost feel and i've heard a lot of people speak about this recently is we think that relationships is easy to just you just show up it's like hollywood um but if if we feel and we acknowledge I'm struggling in relationship, what are some of the things that you recommend or, you know, you 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 kind of empower your clients with to improve their relationships? I'm going to say communication, communication, communication. <laughs> OK, <laughs> OK. Um, I think. Um, and empathy, I think, oh, empathy, tolerance. So I, I often I hear couples come to me and they're asking for help and support and they feel that they're not heard, they feel they're not acknowledged, they feel they're being controlled, um, that the other person doesn't communicate with them. But they don't communicate because all, the, all, the, all their, when they talk to talk to each other it's often just transactional mm -hmm. have you got the shopping can you drop the kids off to school it's very much that kind of level rather than about the relationship um they just i think well we have two ears and one mouth and i think it's a very good reason for that if only we listen more and acknowledge the other person because immediately what I, I see so often, Piers, so one person will say, but you didn't do X, Y, and Z, or you did X, Y, and Z. And the other one will jump in immediately and justify. Mm. Instead of saying, actually listening to what, and acknowledging what their partner said. You don't have to agree with them, but at least listen and let them know that you've heard their side of the story. Because if, you feel your side of the story is not heard, you're going to shut down. You say, what's the point? You're not listening. Um, I love the phrase as listening to respond and is listening to understand. And quite often people listen to respond. They listen to the first half of the sentence and then they're immediately in their head, they're practicing what they're going to say in response or in retaliation. <laughs> they haven't heard the whole sentence so therefore they're not listening to understand what the other person is trying to convey and they might miss a whole section of what their partner was going to say to them mm -hmm. so they jumped in and said that's what you said um, and then that's it and then it goes on and it builds and builds and builds and builds and builds and they end up not even, and I've been there, I promise I've been there. You don't even remember what the argument was about. 
Yeah. But really, there's underlying issues. It's yeah, you haven't, you didn't bother taking taking the bin out. You didn't, but you haven't. You never help with washing up. You never help cook a meal. You never, etc. There are underlying things here that what it, that that's the symptom in my view. Those are symptoms. What's really being said is, I feel taken for granted. I feel that you treat me like a skivvy. I feel as you know, you never spend any time with me. We never go anywhere. I feel abandoned. So often there, it's it's what's listening to what is going on underneath. And mm. I think curiosity, being curious is such a great, it's a great kind of aid, isn't it? If we're only curious, tell me more about that. Help me understand that. It's much more helpful than, but I didn't say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really love that. Tell me more about that. It's like getting interested and curiosity. I think it's one of the Stoic philosophy. I think it's one of the eight, um, called it Arte, the um, um, the, the principles. Um, so we've got curiosity, a courage, um, self-actualization, so things like that. And curiosity is one of them. Let, well, I messed up. Let's get interested rather than hammer beating our heads going, you idiot. Yeah. Which I notice as a trauma survivor myself and clients or people I work with is they often do that as well. Very hard on themselves. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's my mm. fault. I did something wrong. What did I do wrong? Mm. Would it be okay if I just shared something personal for me? Yeah. Yeah. Just, go for it. Because it, it um, I think it might illustrate some of this about why we take the blame, why it's our fault. So as a I was an only child, um, and my parents had their own issues, but I didn't know that as a child, but you know, I know now. So I can't blame them, but at that time I didn't understand. So I didn't get the attention, I didn't get my needs met. Um, my mother would, she would sulk. She was a sulker. So she wouldn't tell me what I'd done wrong. She wouldn't tell my dad what I'd done. he'd done wrong either. And the longest she ever went was six weeks without speaking to us. Um, I never did learn what I'd done wrong. And I could remember sitting at her feet begging, what have I done wrong? Tell me what I've done wrong. I'm so sorry, mommy. I'm so sorry. So people pleasing started very early on. But what I used to notice was that I wouldn't get my needs met for my parents, but when they were with their friends, they were different, completely different. They were happy. They would be spend time with their friends' children and uh, make a big fuss of them and tell me how, how wonderful their friends' children were. Well, that left me thinking, it must be me. It's my fault. I'm unlovable. So I just want to give you that little thing because that went on for ages. I'm trying to get uh, accepted, trying to people please in all areas of my life. Sue Cleaver, she's an actress, she's in Correlation Street, which I don't watch, but she's also a psychotherapist. And I think she worded it beautifully. That She said, I tried on many coats before I found the one that fitted. In other words, trying to find the right tribe our own tribe that fits for us. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing mm. that real sense of, yeah, I'm unlovable getting that from your mom. Must be me. Must be me. Because they get on well with everybody. Everybody else is fine. Must be me. Yeah. 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 And I guess so many people listening will it will hit, you know, be, yeah, I've I've been through that. I recognize some of that. Mm. yeah i often hear this not from people is like i grew up thinking i was the milkman son because i was like i'm nothing to do with these people yeah. they're, they're just you know they're just nothing like me so my my wife said the same thing it's like you know being born into the wrong family being born on the wrong planet yeah yeah you doubt it don't you i think i can even 
I can even remember thinking I must have been adopted. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. 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 Thank you. So there's lots of things that kind of affect us. I suppose that's what I was saying, you know, really illustrating that little bit of how those things will follow us. Yeah, thank you. I was speaking to my last guest, Shashi Saluna, um, who she was saying, because I said, you know, there was some figure in 2017 that from the WHO saying that 70% of adults have had some form of trauma. And she was saying it's probably more like 100% have had some form of trauma. It's just to the degree to which we've had it. And I think Gabor Mate saying that trauma is any experience that's too much for us to process, digest and integrate. Yeah. And I feel that it's coming more to the fore with Gabor Mate's work and your work, other people's work, that it's such a thing, trauma. Mm -hmm. And it is impacting people, it is impacting relationships. Yeah, and, and what happens is our, our nervous system becomes dysregulated. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what's happening. It, it is that basic survival, which we all need. Otherwise, if we didn't have that basic survival mechanism within us, we'd all end up walking off the edge of a cliff or doing something equally as dangerous. So we need that. But it's it, when we feel that sense of a trauma or an upset that's overwhelming, our nervous system does become dysregulated. And therefore, that's what happens to us. That fight, flight, freeze, etc. response kicks in. And then we'll be reminded of it because it's stored in our memory. Oh, that's dangerous. Oh, that's a worry. Oh, I remember that. Mm. And the brain does. And it doesn't remember the event, but it remembers it was fearful. Mm. Mm. Thank you. I was just doing a bit of research the last few weeks and the um i think it's the hippocampus is is almost like that part of our brain it, it, the author dawson church talks about it a bit like the historian in the brain right this has happened before and right it's happening again sound yeah. the alarm the amygdala whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> that's it exactly that's it i often see it as a photo album mm -hmm. i always imagine this photo album stored in our brain and it will store the more negative things because they're the ones that the brain's going, well, I need to keep us safe. So we don't need to worry about the good time you had because that's not so important. But when you nearly run out in front of that car, that's, that needs to be stored. Mm -hmm. All of those kind of memories that were scary, whatever they were, or unpleasant. Yeah, photo album. And then I then use a metaphor of it's like a fruit machine. You press the button and you never know which numbers are going to come up. Yeah. It will be random and it'll be, oh, yeah. But then it will collect even more information. It'll say, and then there was that, and then there was that, and do you remember that? So it actually endorses our feelings of fear, upset, distress, unhappiness, whatever. Yeah, thank you. You said a word before about um, our nervous system is becoming dysregulated. And I kind of, as you said that, it's like almost seeing that this is just theory I'm having at the moment is that because so much of humanity is feeling this trauma, because our nervous systems are becoming dysregulated, is it that we're also projecting it out onto our environment by how we are so therefore our environment is becoming dysregulated because of the the trauma. I mean, this is obviously a, not necessarily a question for you, but it's just a thought which is going around my head is, could that be why the nervous system of the earth, the ecosystem is breaking down because the main inhabitants? Yeah, could well be, because we're all connected, aren't we? Mm, yeah, mm. Whether you believe in spirituality or whether it is, we're you know we're we have an electric sir electrical circuit within us we mm. pick up the vibes of each other so surely yeah there must be some i i could imagine not that it's my field at all but i could imagine that mm, mm, mm. Mm. which is also very positive then if we can change and heal do therapy you know 
move shift the trauma from our bodies then we can also impact the world so it's very really positive yeah yeah oh, beautiful beautiful i'd like to mention when we talk about our nervous system if i may because mm -hmm. um i don't know if you know of jane evans she did a wonderful tedx talk um and it's how to tame your meerkat brain um it talks about because she talks about the brain and the fact it uh, uh, and she translates it into animals mm -hmm. and i just love it she talks about when our our meerkat brain you know that that our when we are dysregulated and that part of our brain that is really jangled she talks about that being the meerkat brain and i love that because when you think about a meerkat it's really always up and looking and, and looking for the danger and until we can calm our meerkat we can't possibly re reason and figure you know while we're in that state we can't reason we can't use our intelligent part of our brain to work things through and be logical about it so i'd love to say to people i mean she did it for children and she uses animals in it but i I use it with my clients all the time since I discovered Jane because it's just so lovely. Everybody, I should think anyone you could think of knows about meerkats. They've watched it on a wildlife program or something. You think, oh, meerkats up and running. And they'll say, oh, your meerkats out, you know, and people will see almost, um, um, it doesn't make it quite so fearful because they can see, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, my meerkats up and running. Oh, yeah, he's got all his mates in with him as well. <laughs> We're all at it. And I just love that because until we do that, until we learn that, until we re-regulate our nervous system, we we haven't got hope in hell of working things through. We can't, we can't engage our intelligent part of our brain, our prefrontal cortex. Just won't engage at all. So if that comes up in relationships, Wendy, our meerkats like, whoa, whoa what do we do what do you suggest to people to regulate their meerkat to bring them back into thinking do you know what? i think we all have different i think we all have different ways of 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 calming our our nervous system um and we use different situations and different strategies at different times mm -hmm. so it's well known i mean we talk about breathing but some people can't breathe it's too much they are so anxious they can't do that um there is suggested about um yoga meditation now mm -hmm. sometimes that will work for some people sometimes it's it's really good but there are other times when it might be i need to have a drink of water i need to do something to re rem remind myself i'm in the here and now so do something every day you know an everyday task it might be connecting with nature now if i'm feeling a bit jangled i'll quite often just go for a walk i've got a little nature reserve near where i live and to go and connect with nature really calms my nervous system mm -hmm. sometimes it's talking to somebody mm -hmm. and it might be I need to chat with someone. Sometimes it's working through the issue with somebody. Sometimes it's turning the music up loud and putting on some heavy rock. It's almost getting us, it might be dancing because it's moving, it's changing the state that we're, you know, I don't mean we're in a state, but <laughs> as in a mess, but a state, we're in a particular state in our bodies. And it is just whatever it takes at that time. Now, if we're in that situation in a relationship, Sometimes, and maybe it got into a really nasty argument, I just say, well, look, call time. Call time, walk away, because you can't engage while one or both of you, meerkat, is up, up and rampant. It's not going to happen. It will just get worse. But, of course, that's easier said than done, and it takes a lot of practice and willingness to do it. So, Yeah. So, mm, thank you great i love those that was a really great suggestion i mean kind of yoga meditation drink water maybe breathing connecting with nature listening to someone calling time i mm. think that's great because we can sometimes spiral it's like they start we start they start oh, oh, oh my god where did that come from 
yeah yeah it, and, it, and it then becomes really unpleasant it becomes toxic it becomes it words are said that can't be taken back and then yeah it's really sad then yeah 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 thank you thank you Ed. so i'm thinking you know one of the things i noticed in one of your articles through some of the things i've been listening to on your podcast was about um, connecting to our emotions in relationships. So a lot of my clients dissociate, have dissociated to a huge degree, you know. And so I, I would love to hear your wisdom about what you guide your clients to, to help them reconnect with that emotional household to their bodies. Yeah, I, again, it's... It's sometimes we feel that certain emotions aren't acceptable. Mm -hmm. We're taught that. Um, maybe they were never modelled. Uh, so I think it, it sometimes, and, and sometimes it's not safe. So it is how do you reconnect? And it can be really tricky. Uh, there's a great, um, it's called the, the feeling wheel. I don't know if you know of it. No, I've heard um, of the consent wheel, but not the feeling wheel. Yes, and it, it's uh, it, I, I printed quite a few off for clients, and and I work with it because it will, it, it's got it's divided into sections, and once you sit with somebody and you, they may find it difficult to express their feelings, and I say okay, what comes up for you, and then they might pick on one, and then we get curious, and then well which other one might you connect with, and what does that come up for you, or what. What does that feel like? What happened if you tried to express that? So I think it's it's a really great one. And I, I'll give you the details after this of where you can find it. We can put it in the show notes, hopefully. Yeah, great. Thank yes, you. Yes, it's a really great tool because sometimes it's hard to get in touch with our emotions um, for lots of reasons. Like I say, well, we're taught how to eat with a knife and fork or tie our shoes up, mm -hmm. but we're not always taught taught how to express our emotions or what those emotions are mm -hmm. how do you know unless you're taught oh you've fallen over and you're hurt you you've hurt yourself you're crying because you've hurt your knee then the child will go oh okay you've got a tummy ache is it because you're hungry or is it because something you've eaten mm -hmm. you know the the kind of how do we know unless those words or those expressions are put to our emotions or what's going on for us mm -hmm. or it might be you're not allowed to it's not allowed if we never see our parents arguing how can you have how do you feel it's safe to argue and that you can have an argument and yet you you know it's not the end of the world you're still going to be okay um what if you only experience arguing when he was really shouting it might not be safe to have an argument and there's lots of things that we've experienced that are difficult. So it is just learning about what it's like. And then I encourage people, what does it feel like? Where do you feel it in your body? Mm. Can you tell me? And I, some people, it, this works with peers, but some people it doesn't. I ask them, where do you feel it? And if they say, oh, I feel it in my chest. If you could, could you give it a shape? Could you give it a form? Could you give it a colour? What might it be like? Would it be concrete? Would it be stone? Would it be... I, I try not to guide them because... But then, okay, so what does it... How does that feel? What's it like? Is it heavy? Is it... And, and just getting them to get in touch with what it's like. And what's interesting is the more they talk about it, quite often they can shrink that shape. It's quite interesting. So it's almost like they're meeting and feeling by talking about it. Yeah. Do you ever get that when you the client walks out the door and say, I feel like a weight's been lift off me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Because they've shared it. They've actually been able to speak the truth mm. without I, judgment. Yeah. I get that a lot in the men's circles I do. I do it mainly with ex-boarders. And over the years, because we've learned never to say anything, even the terrible abuse and, you know, that when we hear someone else sharing, 
it's like, oh my God, I'm not alone. I've just been locked in this prison inside myself to hear someone else speak. And when they share as well is powerful, but it's almost like when they hear someone else share, it's like, finally, I realize I'm not alone, especially we have a group of 10, 15 people sometimes. Yeah. They can hear 10 people and go, oh my God, this feels so great to actually have other people talk about these things. So yes, I, I totally hear that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And how many times have people who've been abused in some way carry the shame of others? Mm -hmm. it, it, the, the shame belongs with the abuser, but the person who's been abused often carries the shame, the guilt. It must be something I did. Or if I tell the shame that it will bring to others or it's it that's horrendous in my view yeah 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 i had that myself i was sexually abused at school i never shared and uh, you know when i did talk to one of my friends in my 30s he said to me oh the same thing happened to me same with the same teacher same thing and and I think that's it. It's like when we share, when we have those safe spaces to share and go, yeah, this is me. But it does need to be safe because that vulnerability, I think I was listening to you talk a bit or one of your articles about vulnerability, you know, how to allow us to be vulnerable. I think we, that's something I've really struggled with. I'm, you know, I feel I'm okay with it now. But I was like, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. Because it wasn't that safe. No. No. Well, maybe you could have been threatened or you could have, if you'd spoken up, would you have been believed? Would you have received more punishment? And, it did, and, and what if other people heard it and they, how how would they have felt? If you, you know, what if you, if your parents learned about it and then, or they would have felt so bad because they'd sent you to that school and you'd have to worry about them. I mean, people don't appreciate how that ricochets out and how, as a child, you're trying to protect other people. You're worrying about what will happen. Will I be sent away? Will I be sent into care? Will I be... all So many things, let alone just being believed, but it's, it's, it's just so many things that people don't stop and think about that that, child who's been abused how it affects them yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. but we you carried that shame and that guilt that didn't belong to you and i feel like breaks my heart to hear that mm, thank you Andy. yeah i see that now it's like it's become my gift and i think i talk about this the work of uh, robert bligh quite a lot and him saying where our wound is, is where our greatest, that would be the greatest gift that we can give back to society. And I feel that with, whether it's childhood trauma or something like boarding school, mm. that if we can do the healing work, go into the dark spaces, we've got to go into and feel it. What yeah. was it like? Yeah. Grieve, whether that is tears or really connect, then we can give the gift of right and we, it's like, this happened to me, this is not going to happen to anyone else. Yeah. And because I've experienced it, it's like, yeah, um, it becomes our... Um, Superpower? Yeah, our power. It's like, yeah. Um, you know, you shared about your stories of your relationships. It's become your power. Mm. I go, I, I, I know about this. Oh, thank you. So, you know, we've got um, probably uh, coming up to an hour and about uh, 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a couple more questions, really. I mean, actually, I went through your blogs this morning. I wrote another um, 10, 10 areas. I was like, oh, I could talk about this. Um but I'd love to just talk a bit about anxiety. I see this come up again and again in my work with clients. Could you talk a bit about anxiety and 
you know, what is the underlying cause for you of anxiety? Um, anxiety is a very useful part of us. We all need to have it mm. because it's actually, it's part of our survival system. If we didn't feel anxious at any point, we wouldn't be, well, our meerkat wouldn't be up and watching for danger. So we do need a certain amount of anxiety within us. Of course we do. Keeps us alert, keeps us safe. But when it becomes too much, that's when we find it hard to deal with. Um, anxiety, I think the underlying issue really is uncertainty. So if we're uncertain about things, it will be fear of the unknown. Well, what if? And I don't know what's going to happen. But the, I think we all kid ourselves that we do have certainty in our lives <laughs> because it will be too much if if we were if we were constantly anxious and worried about every situation in our lives, we would really be nervous wrecks completely all the time. So we we kind of believe that we have certainty, that we're going to live to old age, we're going to draw our old age pension or whatever it is, that we are going to be going on holiday next year, um, that our partner will be coming home after work, we're going to have 2.4 children, whatever it is, we're going to buy that next house. We all have that need for planning and a sense of certainty. And I guess that that's kind of what we get into, but when you look at, the pandemic that left us with a huge amount the whole planet was we're uncertain there's so much uncertainty and i think that's where people got really where huge anxiety and came from was the, the acknowledgement that actually no the world isn't as safe as we thought it was so i think it dysregulated our nervous system again and that's where that sense of anxiety and it is i think people's sense of anxiety with a window of tolerance there is a if you believe the window of tolerance where it's okay you can either go out of it upwards where you've got you know you're hyper or you hypo whereas you just collapse so if you're out of that window of tolerance i think it's diminished to some for some people to quite a degree and that's i think it's just as though our nervous system is short-circuited in some situations it's like the smoke alarm that goes off when it doesn't need to like <laughs> my oven needs a really good clean and if i if i'm if i don't open all the windows then my smoke alarm goes off because it believes that there's a fire in the house but it's just because i just need to get someone in to clean the oven but it's that's the same with our nervous system mm -hmm. it's misfiring how do we uh, clean the oven of our nervous system? I think it's learning to become more resilient. It's learning to be in touch with our nervous system. It's learning to sit with that discomfort, um, which can be uncomfortable. If we keep pushing it down, it's going to erupt again. And we're going to go through the same situation again. So it's learning, okay, let me sit with this. It's uncomfortable, but my body's telling me something. Is it real danger or is it just we're being triggered? Mm -hmm. Misfiring, if you like. Um, what's it like to sit with that discomfort? And we can sit through it. We can. We can tolerate it if we allow ourselves. But most people go, I can't, so I distract myself. I'll disengage. I'll dissociate, I'll go and do something, I'll fill my life with something else, whether it's buying clothes, whether it's, um, you know, an addiction, whether it's having a drink, whatever it is, it, that's, that's covering it up. But if we can learn to be able to do that, and then we become more resilient, and then remind ourselves, well, I got through that, actually, I can do it, that wasn't so bad, so next time I can do that. Mm. So that, that's great yeah 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 i like that because the window of tolerance i've been listening to peter levine and bessel van der Kolk talk about this and i love that just sitting with it the uncomfortable it just allows us to open that window of tolerance yeah you know and it's interesting i've often thought of this 
before I heard of the window of tolerance that as ex-boarders or I would say, you know, trauma survivors is that we've kind of fat flat line. We become flat line. Yeah. You get too excited at, in this environment. You get laughed at or punished or, you know, yeah. brought down to a peg. And if you get too depressed or too angry, then also. So I almost feel that I love that, that you just sit with it. Mm. Sit with that discomfort. So I resonate totally. And I think we don't have to sit with it all the way through. If you can just tolerate it for five minutes and then grow that tolerance time. I would say baby steps, mm. baby steps, baby steps. Because if you try and leap the chasm, the chance so you're going to fall down in there into it and you never want to come out of it, it's too difficult. So if you can sit with that feeling and you put off that distraction or whatever it is, if you can sit with it for five minutes, for 10 minutes, grow it, because then the window of tolerance organically gets bigger. Thank you. Yeah, I love that. That's beautiful. I think I've often felt that baby steps. I think as the, the Taoist phrase, the journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step. Yeah. And I think that's useful for me. And it has been in my own healing journey is yeah, just one step at a time. Right. Okay. One step at a time. Yeah. yeah. And and the other thing I'll, I'll often say to clients as well, if I may, is I ask, they, they'll say, well, you know, every, everyone's impatient to get on with their lives. Of course they are. They want to be healed. They want to, everything to be over. Of course you do. But I say to them, how long have you been living with this situation? And they might say, five years, 10 years, 20 years. I say, could I just ask you, do you think it's reasonable that you are going to resolve this in three weeks, six, mm. six months. Mm. Can I ask you to be more compassionate with yourself? I understand your impatience, of course, but just be more compassionate. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I see that it's like the practice part of the element that I teach people is to have a daily practice, you know, and it for me, it's a life journey. We begin, we've learned these negative things that we've practiced for 5, 10, 20 years. And then we install kindness, love, compassion, you know. Yeah. And then we practice them every day, consistently. Yeah. And it creates those new neural pathways. Yeah. And we sometimes fall back into the old ways. And then we forgive ourselves. We have that curiosity. Oh, I just got triggered by my wife <laughs> again. <laughs> oh, that, that's interesting. Begin again. Yeah. yeah. And it, um, awareness is the first step. And that, that is, I think, the easiest in a way. Because the changing, the changing the neural pathways, changing the habits, changing those blueprints, that's the, much harder. It's possible. But we know that it's really hardwired quite often into our brain. So... We just have to be more compassionate and gentle. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I resonate so much with that. So we're just kind of drawing to the end. I so appreciate your time and your your wisdom and, and for all the work you, you do. Uh, so any final words you'd love to share with people about childhood trauma, relationships? That's some wisdom from your 18 years, if you could go... Yes, you haven't that you haven't already shared i was going to say 18 years plus because i've lived a lot oh, of course yes yeah wow wisdom i think it is that kindness and compassion for ourselves um and i think that can i use another example that i love that i use yeah. and think about about change when you think Okay, the, you're going down, there's a path that you normally take. It's a, it's a woodland path, but it's well trodden and it, you get from A to B. Maybe you're going to the shops, just a particular shop you want to get to. And you know that path and it's been tread, trodden well. There's, there's growth, undergrowth there on both sides. But because that path has been so well used, it's, it, it's clear. But one day you're told you can't go down that path anymore. For whatever reason, it's blocked. And you there is another way, but it means that you've got to break down the undergrowth and you've got to get through the, 
the brambles, the nettles. You've got to clear the branches out of the way. You're going to get scratched. You're going to get bitten. All of those things. And you will find that that path is quite hard to walk for quite a while. But actually, the more you walk it, the clearer it gets and the easier it gets. And I guess that's the metaphor I use quite often about making changes. Thank you. That's a beautiful metaphor. I love that. The path through the woodland and then going for a new path. Yeah, mm -hmm. the brambles, the nettles. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. So I'll put a link to your website, your book, and also to your podcast on, on Amazon. Any other ways of people reaching out to you? or um, Yeah, I'm on Instagram. I'm on LinkedIn. Yes, the podcast. Yes, you can find me on my website, as you said. I think you just search Wendy Capewell. It's, you'll probably, hopefully find me quite easily. I think if we can also put that link to the feelings wheel, that yeah. website, if that's useful, I'll, I'll, I'll let you have that as well, because that's a really, it's a really nice one to use, I think. Mm, yeah, I like that. I hadn't heard of it, um, mm. so I will um, have a look. Oh, and also Jane Evans, her mm. TEDx talk, because I think oh, that's lovely. I mean, it's certainly, I'm, I'm aware of talk, talking to people about, neural pathways in uh, our nervous system but i just love the way that she talks about the meerkat and then she talks about the the elephant me being the mid back brain where all our memory is the hippocampus and then the 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 neuro uh, <laughs> the intelligent part of the brain it's gone up my head but she calls that the monkey brain and i just love that you know, because it it's, uh, I don't do psychobabble. I just don't do it. I think just plain speaking, it speaks to you, you know, that everyone, they get it rather than when we start talking technically, it's probably glaze over and it doesn't, they don't need to feel silly that they don't understand it. So yeah, I'm very much about plain talking. So yeah, let's put that in there as well. Will do. I will do. Well, thank you so much for your time and uh, yeah, your wisdom. I've really enjoyed speaking to you today. Yeah, thank you so much, Piers. It's been a delight. Thank you. So I'll press stop now, but if we continue our conversation. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Wendy.